Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on professional practices. My name is Rachel Escobedo. I am the online ambassador for Stanford programs. Just a couple ground rules for today's webinar. Um, if you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to enter them into the chat box. We'll be monitoring them and we will hold all of our questions until the end. Also, there is a handout section on your control panel. Uh, that's where you can access some of the handouts that our speakers have provided for you. I'll include more reminders for the handouts at, um, throughout the webinar. But without further ado, let's get started. I'd love to introduce our two speakers today. We have Brian Nethero. He is our project manager, or he's a project manager at Ed Plus at Arizona State University. He is our, going to be our moderator today. Brian Nethero serves as a consultant for Sanford Inspire with National University. Brian previously served as executive director for Sanford Inspire at Arizona State University. During his seven plus years with the program, Brian has been involved with all phases of program development and implementation. Outside of Stanford, Brian has worked in various education roles, including classroom teacher, teacher development, and school leadership. Beyond work, Brian loves being a dad, being a husband, dad, and foodie. Our other speaker is Lisita Villa. She is also a project manager at Ed Plus at Arizona State University. A little bit about Lisita. Lisita is currently a project manager supporting the Starbucks College Achievement Plan at Ed Plus at Arizona State University. She graduated in, in May of 2017 with her doctorate of education from ASU. Lisita first joined ASU working in the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College with the Stanford Inspire program. During her six years with the Teachers College, she worked as a clinical instructor, a curriculum coordinator, and as a teaching and learning specialist, all with the Stanford Inspire program. Prior to that, she spent a year as the director of curriculum and instruction at a middle school and graduated with a master's in educational administration and supervision from Arizona State University in 2011. Her career began in Phoenix in 2005 as a sixth grade teacher in South Phoenix. She is a Teach for America Corps alumna and taught for five years. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree in Spanish from Westmont College in Santa Barbara in 2005. Welcome, Lisita and Brian. Good morning, everybody. Thank Hello. you so much for joining us. Awesome, um, thank you. I'm, yeah, and thank you so much, Rachel, for the kind introduction. So um, we'll just go ahead and get the, the ball rolling here. So we're so excited that everyone is able to join us this morning um, for us to be able to talk about the domain of professional practices. Um, within the Sanford Inspire framework. So today we are hoping to provide you all with um, some of the research and development that went into um, this particular domain. And we will also talk about how you can implement um, this, these modules within a teacher prep program as well in the traditional um, district sort of setting. And so by the end of today's um, webinar, we will have covered all three of these topics. And hopefully if you have any questions, um, we're happy to sort of answer those um, off the cuff at the end of the presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing that I would like for everybody to do is to sort of think about this question in orange on the screen. And it says, what is the greatest thing that teachers need support with in regards to professionalism? And we're gonna do a quick poll and I believe Rachel is going to be putting in the chat messenger sort of um, location the link to this website. Or if all of you have your phones available, you can text this Lucita via 435 to that phone number. And we're just going to take a quick poll to think about when it comes to teacher professionalism, what are the things that teachers need the most support in? So thank you, you Lisa. Yeah, thank you. So I just sent the link to everyone in the chat box, but if you have your cell phones nearby, please go ahead and uh, enter your response that way. Okay. Let's, give, let's give everybody maybe like a minute. Sure. And I'm just gonna transition over to 
where we can start seeing some of our responses come in real time. So, oh my goodness, we have um, a large, large amount of, of responses coming in. So I saw a few things around boundaries. Um, I see diversity. Um, I see parent, I see um, dress code, I think was in there. I see management, um, behavioral support, and I think I see classroom space or classroom support, balancing again, cultural though, um, and I don't know if this is having to do necessarily with sort of cultural competence, um, equity, relationships management, but cultural has been, um, it looks like the most trending topic here out of everyone's response of responses, but I see that we have a huge range that um, we all have identified or things that we think of when it comes to supporting um, teacher professionalism. So I'm going to give a little bit of a backstory to how the Sanford Inspire framework came to be. Um, uh, many years ago, actually now, I was going to say a few years ago, but many years ago, um, as we started to think about building professional development for teachers. Um, we really wanted to think about what was in the landscape of supporting and evaluating um, good teacher practice. And so when it came to particular frameworks, we had heard over and over again, we have the intact standards, there's Marzano framework, we have TAP, we have Danielson, as well as the teaching as leadership framework. And so what we ended up doing in order to build the Sanford Inspire framework, we actually took all of those five frameworks, we overlaid them, we did a cross work. And what we ended up doing is highlighting and creating a framework that actually covers all of those topic areas and those evaluation um, structures. And that's how the Sanford Inspire framework came to be. So in our framework, we have five domains. There's learning environment, planning and delivery, motivation, student growth and achievement, and then professional practices. And so, like I had just said, those all of those five different um, frameworks or evaluation structures like Danielson and Marzano, et cetera, were all utilized in creating and building this Sanford Inspire framework. Um, right here where you see my um, arrow moving are different topic areas that are underneath the planning are underneath each one of these domains. And today we're gonna to specifically talk about professional practices and these three topic areas. So in professional practices, the three topic areas we have are reflective practitioner, professional conduct, cultural responsive pedagogy, and all together under these three topic areas, we have 16 modules, which I am really particularly proud of. Um, as a teaching and learning specialist, I help build and research um, and take sort of um, test these modules out up against or like refer to researchers within, within our college here at ASU, um, collaborate with practitioners who are in the field to actually build these modules. Um, and so I'm really proud to say that I think for a topic area that at times doesn't give as much, get as much attention um, as professional practices usually do, I'm really proud to say that we do have 16 modules that help support teachers. And I believe it supports teachers, not just in their sort of novice um, beginning years, but all the way through their veteran years as well. So we are gonna go ahead and we're gonna take a deep dive right now into professional conduct. And I would like to think as professional conduct, um, most of the time, this is where I think the traditional topics for professional practices tend to pop up. So as you'll see here, these are five modules that we have within this topic area. And these are, I think, the traditional areas that people think of. Maintaining professional relationships with colleagues, um, maintaining professional relationships with students, sort of that like that boundary between friend and authoritarian. Um, again, also these topic areas of working with parents, strategies for engaging parents, um, and even, and I don't know if anyone mentioned this in the Wordle pool, but even like teacher professionalism in the age of social media, like as you start to think about that technological piece of, we have so many things that happen online, like how do I also maintain my professionalism online with the students? So these are some of the modules that I think are more traditionally turned to when it comes to, or people think of professionalism. Um, but I'm also excited to say that I think there are two other really exciting modules in this, this topic area. 
Um, one is teacher activism, how to get involved, and coaching or coping with teacher stress. Now these are, I think, non-traditional because I don't think anyone would necessarily always think of these topics. But honestly, when we started to dig into the literature, these, the frameworks that we built up the Sanford Inspire framework, um, when we started digging into just even the stories that hit the headlines, we often were seeing things that pop up around people wanting to be activists on behalf of their students, on behalf of their profession, and then the different like difficult areas that teachers would get into because of, uh, because of that. And then over and over again, when we were within our own teachers college and out in the field, we kept hearing stories of teachers just burning out, not being able to handle all of the day in and day out stresses, stressors that, were, um, that they were facing. And um, just to throw in a really interesting tidbit, um, actually out of all of 16 modules in this domain, coping with teacher stress is the highest, this is a module with the highest completion rate, like for, um, of all of the modules that get started, 86%, 86, I think 83% of teachers who complete, who start this module, finish it. And I just think that it again is just one of those topic areas that we know is relevant to teachers, but we actually haven't had any trainings necessarily to really support teachers in how to handle um, the stressors of our job. And so that's actually one of the modules I wanted to be able to focus in on today and to sort of highlight for you. So um, I believe Rachel is going to be starting up a video for us in just a moment. But in the video, what I want you to be able to see is it's going to focus in on one, how to find this teacher stress, um, coping with teacher stress module within our domain. But also it's going to highlight some of the relaxation practices that we teach the teachers within the module. And I just think this is a really great testimony to not only do we cover what the topic is and the research behind it, but we really want people to walk away with strategies to help them address this um, in their everyday um, going on as, as a teacher. Thanks, Lucita. Okay, let's take a look at the video. To start off, let's take a look at some strategies to improve relaxation. Stress can cause muscle tension, racing thoughts, and sleep disruption. These symptoms may be the cause of or lead to stress-related anxiety. A person who incorporates relaxation techniques into his or her daily life can feel relief from these side effects. Our first relaxation technique is abdominal breathing. The great thing about abdominal breathing is that you can practice it anywhere and anytime. This technique can especially be useful when experiencing rapid breathing and increased heartbeat. Let's practice this technique together. Place your hands on your stomach. Breathe in deeply through your nose. As you breathe in, you should feel your stomach rise. This could take some practice before it feels natural. Now hold in your breath for a few seconds. And then exhale slowly out of your mouth you should feel your stomach sink back down. While taking part in abdominal breathing, focus on your breath and allow any thoughts to enter. As you exhale, just let your thoughts float away. The goal is not to stop our thoughts, but to acknowledge them non-judgmentally and then let them go. Repeat this process over the course of a few minutes. Let's practice together one more time. Remember you can do abdominal breathing virtually anywhere or anytime, in between classes, when you wake up, or on the bus home. If you would like to take some time to practice your abdominal breathing, click the practice button. If you would like to move on, press proceed.
Excellent. So that was just a brief little video to show like one piece of a larger module that really is focusing in on um, providing not only giving some sort of the, the research behind and the experiences and what the facts are like the, the statistics of um, teacher burnout and stress, but then also being able, being able to hand teachers strategies for them to be able to take into the classroom and into the workplace every single day um, coping with teacher stress. So um, beyond that module, I think I had mentioned oops, here we go, um, that uh, teacher activism, how to get involved is also sort of, I think of like a non-traditional uh, module or, or idea when we think about professional practices and teachers. And um, I wanted just to be able to show um, some of the, the wonderful resources that we have um, within this module and how it speaks about teacher activism. So I'm going to pull up the coaching guide. And I think that might be a good um, size for everybody to be able to see. So this is a coaching guide and with each module, um, you are able to walk away with a coaching guide which is sort of um, a real brief overview of what is within a module, um, the key takeaways um, that like the essential knowledge, essential mindsets that um, a participant would walk away with, um, sort of a screenshot, not screenshot, but like a quick snapshot of what this skill, if somebody walked away successfully understanding this module, what this would look like, the skill in action, and then also some um, some questions for discussions if there was um, somebody wanted to do this module with a colleague or if this was going to be something that's going to be part of a coaching situation where um, we wanted to be able to unpack and, and talk about what we learned in order to, to be able to see this in action for the teacher. So this is a coaching guide. We have this with every single one of our modules. And I wanted to highlight this because I think when we hear even teacher activism, some people will be like, well, that is weird. That's really interesting. That's in, in our professional practices. But it was one of the things that, um, well, I guess as an educator, I'm always really proud because I think other teachers are so um, fired up and they care about not only being the best that they can be for their students, but helping to make positive change in the environment in their schools, in their communities and whatnot. And so we do see that often teachers are activists for their students, as well as making positive change for, um, for education, whether it's in the state level or nationally. And so one of the things we wanted to provide is one, some really solid mindsets to think about teacher activism. So um, just also thinking about like, Yes, we need to have a sense of empathy. We need to have a clear understanding of our community, but also like a feeling of armed love, meaning that um, we are going to um, be advocates for the, the betterment for our students, betterment for our communities, et cetera, but we're not going to be pushing our own agenda on people, but that this is gonna come from a place of understanding and knowing our students and our communities. Um, so one, like Rachel had said previously, this is something that's in your handouts. And I just think that this highlights really um, well what you would get out of this module, but also um, sort of the, the standpoint of we know that teachers are going to be activists, that they do speak out on behalf of, um, of, of our students and our schools. Um, and so what are some things that we can take in mind and keep in mind as, as they move forward? Get us back to here. Um, so that is kind of a, a brief overview of the topic area of professional conduct under professional practices. Um, the next topic area I wanted to hop into was culturally responsive pedagogy, which I'm really excited about because I think a few of you had mentioned that in the Wordle pool. Wordle poll. <laughs> I think there was no pool here. Um, and so I'm really excited to say that um, we have six wonderful modules that really cover the topic of culturally responsive pedagogy in a very thorough, um, but I think um, very understandable and, and approachable manner. Um, and so we, though um, all of these are, are really wonderful, 
Um, there is not necessarily one particular place that you have to start. Um, one of the things that I will show you in just a second is actually a teacher resource bundle. So if any teacher, if any one of these topics really hits home for anybody, um, they could start at any one of these topics. I do know that within the modules, we often say, hey, if this is a concept that's new to you, um, perhaps you've never heard critical consciousness, um, but we're sort of starting to talk about it under working against racial bias. We do always um, not only highlight, but link to other modules, especially within this particular topic area because they are so interrelated. But in case one of these modules are like, oh man, the concept of affirming difference and valuing background knowledge is something that I'm really passionate about. I wanna start there. You can start in at any one of these modules and you'll be um, presented with the information that is necessary to be successful in the mo module, as well as being directed to others that are, that are in relationship or in support of it. Um, we do have a really wonderful video that I think Rachel is going to be queuing up next. So it's a video um, that is um, of one of a teachers, one of the teachers who has completed um, actually all six of these modules. And she's specifically talking about this module of linking identity and achievement through cultural competence. And she really speaks to the power of the experience and also um, what, sort of what she sort of took away after the end of the module. I was crying at the end of the intro to, I mean, a virtual professional development module that really took me away. Hi, my name is Christine Clark and I've taught language arts for 10 years. The thing that really surprised me about the module was how well a job they tackled such a complex issue in a short amount of time and still did it justice. One thing that I definitely want to start doing is just learning more about my students. Really getting to know who my students are as people. The thing that I really took away from the module was just how important it is to value where my students are coming from um, emotionally, culturally, so I get to know them better, but also how I can use that information to better our entire classroom, regardless of what they look like, what language they speak, religion, gender, anything. Just it's becoming more and more important to celebrate and realize the gifts that those students bring into the classroom. Great, so um, not only did I want to share sort of that testimonial of an experience that a teacher had um, after finishing this particular module, but I also did want to be able to, um, I'm going to skip actually, I'm going to want to share with you um, a resource bundle that um, you have access to that's sort of the focus of how you can take the concepts that you learn within this module um, and translate them into the classroom. So um, before I had showed you a coaching guide, and again, every single module has a coaching guide, but also every single module has a resource bundle. And this is basically what we want to provide um, teachers and practitioners with to be able to translate what we, the big, the theory, sometimes the tough grappling topics that we cover in the modules and help them either do some reflection and retrospection, but also how does that translate into the classroom? So um, I'm gonna start scrolling through here. And let's see. So first of all, um, one, I should just highlight, like, obviously, if you this is a tool that you download and keep. This is, you can hyperlink to any one of the sections around here um, within the tool, um, so it's, like, user-friendly. But as we start off, this gives you, um, one, a breakdown of how to use this, um, because, obviously, cultural competence is not um, just a topic that's easy to understand and it's not just going to take one hour it's going to take some real time and, and reflection to really think about what that means and what does it mean for me and what does it mean for my students and to dig deep into it so there is a definition that's provided for it and then there are three topics like outcomes that are covered in the module and it talks 
hear about like, okay, so if the outcome is that I'd like for my students to have pride in one's cultural heritage and identity, here are some action, here's an action that's associated with that outcome, and then here are specific strategies that a teacher can incorporate into their classroom. I think one of the things that I'm also really proud of as someone who's helped design and, and review all of these modules is the amount of time that we, one, took to sort of vet this with our researchers in the college, our faculty members, as well as with um, testing these things out in the field and getting the feedback. And when it comes to these different strategies, it was definitely not just here's a particular grade level, here's a particular population. We really wanted to think about how could anybody across the US um, in a variety of different grade levels, settings, et cetera, be able to implement and have some of these outcomes for their own classrooms. So as you go through here, you'll be able to see like we give thorough amount of strategies um, and and um, and how they associate with the actions and outcomes that are covered in the module. We also, if you move a little bit further down, there's a graphic organizer for this particular module. Um, so in case you want to be taking notes or this is something that you, you want to do um, and, and capture some of your own um, thoughts. So here are some actions, but what is it that's going to make the most sense for my own classroom or the subject areas that I teach? This is a place where you can um, write some of that information down yourself. I also am really excited to be able to say that we often have planning templates that help you think through and make more specific strategic plans for how to implement this in your classroom. But then there's always usually exemplars that go along with this. So how would this look like if I had filled it in? And really, again, like I said, a lot of these things we just vetted with classroom teachers, whether these are things that we saw in their classroom or someone was looking this over and was like, yes, no, this would make sense, as well as all of the teaching and learning specialists that worked at Sanford were all people who had either come in with extensive amount of teaching experience, teaching experience, and coaching and administrative experience, um, who we were pulling in on from our own experience to create these things. Um, so I'm just going to keep scrolling through just to show you that not only do you walk away with a wonderful module experience and templates to help support you translate strategies into the classroom, you are given a whole bundle of things to help you um, uh, enact this in your everyday sort of setting, as well as all of the references and the culturally responsive pedagogy <laughs> references. Um, there are 80 plus references for each one of these modules. And that just goes to show you the level of care um, and concern that we had for such a huge topic, as well as the breadth of a deep dive that we did into that topic area in order to, to do it justice, kind of like had. Christine had said in that video. Um, just to be able to highlight some of the researchers that their work is um, most prevalent in this, you'll see these particular authors that are on the screen right now um, were cited multiple times and really did impact sort of the direction um, that, that we went with the module and this topic area in general. Um, so I just wanted to be able to cover the last topic area in this domain, which is reflective practitioner. Um, reflective practitioner is um, a small topic area because it has one module within it. Um, the module um, within that area is called examining teacher practices through inquiry. And the evolution of this module and topic area came out of an um, identified sort of need in the field as well as something that came up through our, our teachers college here at ASU, just the emphasis of wanting to really um, make teacher inquiry fundamental to the experiences that our student teachers had here. Um, and so this was actually came out of a project, a larger project that spans all of the different um, student teaching programs that we had here at the teachers college. Um, but one of the neat things about the module is that we actually followed um, two cohorts of teachers, a fourth grade classroom and a fifth, a fourth grade um, teachers, group of teachers, and fifth grade group of teachers, and we actually came back and filled them, filmed them and interviewed them for, I believe it spanned five months as they went through a teacher inquiry project um, as a 
grade level. And so what the video I want to show you right now is just one of the videos that they um, of one of the teams at the very end of the module talking about their experiences as they went through teacher inquiry. Thanks, Lucita. Let's take a look at the video. Since we're going through this process, it's constantly on my mind. So it, it's a helpful reminder to change the way I speak to them. Mm -hmm. So I've not only am looking for them to change their language, but I change my language instead of don't do that. This is what you should be doing. You changed with the kids. Yeah. And we were better about, I love how you do this. Thank you for always doing this. And mm -hmm. they felt appreciated and thanked for what yeah. they do and what they bring. And mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of times through the yeah. negativity, a lot of the kids were just frustrated. You know, just sitting down for these few months and focusing on this, it's, it's so nice to have one main thing to research and really get really deep into and see all the different ways. I mean, there's a million ways that you could be positive and have a positive classroom environment. So it's like even the way that we chose to do it, another group of teachers could choose to do it differently and just having all the help out there that was available and taking different resources and then applying it to what would work for us uh, I think is what was really beneficial in the fact that we had that time to think about it and then we had dates and deadlines to have stuff done I think if it was implemented as a PD from the beginning and there you were being held to it because a lot of PDs you go into and it's like okay we're gonna do this and then nothing ever comes out from it we're here, we did this, and we were held to dates, and we were held to, you know, showing what we had and talking about what we had, and it was still brought up. So I think if it was done where, you know, once a quarter we talked about everything that we've collected and what we're doing and what we're seeing, I think it would be so helpful, and I think for other teachers to be able to take an experience like this and apply it themselves. So that is um, that was part of the last video that we captured um, in the two case studies that are highlighted in this particular video. So we walk teachers and users through every single step of the teacher inquiry process, um, defining the problem, um, examining research, et cetera, all of the different steps. And we have video case study of these teachers um, as examples of the sort of conversations they were having, um, and the thoughts that they were having each step of the way. And we also have really wonderful resources to, again, walk somebody through the teacher inquiry process. Um, but that was just a video at the end of the experience of the teacher sort of talking about um, how powerful it was and, 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 and their particular thoughts there. So um, again, that, this topic area really has just that one module, but it is quite a big module because it covers so much. It covers such a large process. Um, but um, yeah, anyway, so I I wanted us to, to sort of um, end the time of us thinking about the research and development by going back into sort of our Wordle. So I'm going to hop back over here and um, I, like I had said before, I, I do feel really proud to, to say that um, there are 16 modules that really speak to a breadth of needs that we see when it comes to teacher professionalism. It's not just about the traditional concepts of um, boundaries or engaging in um, uh, or how do you maintain professional relationships with students and engaging with parents and working um, with colleagues. We really do have modules that cover culturally responsive pedagogy. How do I, how do I transform the way I think and and act as a teacher um, and be responsive to the needs and who the people are in my classroom, who are my students, to even just a larger topic of teacher inquiry of how can I take this framework of how to think and address a problem in my classroom, how can I be empowered as a teacher to research, identify and research and really implement strategies that are needs for myself. Um, the, the neat thing that I think the domain of professional practices within the Sanford Inspire framework is that we have modules here for not only novice teacher, teachers, but for teachers who've been in the classroom for 16 plus years who can still walk away with something new and exciting to implement in their classroom. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Brian, who will talk a little bit more about how you can implement these modules in your setting. 
Hello, this is Brian. Uh, before I get into my piece, just want to thank and celebrate Lacita. Uh, she's too humble to say it herself, so I will say it for her. She is actually the person who led the development of the Sanford Inspire framework itself and the crosswalking of all the different frameworks to lead to our Sanford framework. Um, she's also one of four key people who, who served as the uh, lead authors for every single module in our framework. So there are four individuals who led all of our modules in development and she is one of them. So uh, it's a treat for me as much as it is for you to be able to hear from her and hear her uh, perspective and insights and uh, just unique thoughts on everything we have available in, in this particular domain. But what I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about is uh, how you can use all of these modules. So many, many different modules in professional practices, 16 in total, three different topics. We're covering a huge range of focus areas, and there are also a variety of different ways you can implement those modules. So I wanted to spend a few minutes addressing that. Regardless of how you're implementing modules, the, the acronym we use to recommend module implementation, no matter what it's going to look like, is CARE. And CARE stands for Complete, Apply, Refine, and Elevate. And this is what we suggest for any module implementation at any level, regardless of the module itself or the implementation strategy. So what this means is, as you're implementing a module, the first thing that's going to happen in that process is for the module itself to be completed. Um, these, are, these modules, some of the topics might seem obvious or might seem self-explanatory, uh, but it's really important that users go through the full module experience before just taking a resource and running with it or taking a coaching guide and running with it so they can really understand the research and the background knowledge that comes with that module itself. The next step is to apply something you learn from that module. So we expect that every user who goes through a module is going to take away something from that module, some nugget or strategy that they can put into practice in their setting. And that's our second recommended step. After you finish the module, take something and start applying it in, in the setting where you work, regardless of that setting. Uh, the third step, I would argue, is the most important, is to refine your implementation that you started with the apply step. So whatever it is that you're doing, you're, you're not going to be perfect at it the first time. So make mistakes, ask questions, seek help, and continue to refine your implementation for whatever your module of focus is so that you're uh, constantly iterating and improving the work you're doing around that module. And, and the last step in this process is kind of the result of the first three, which is you are elevating not only yourself as an educator, but more importantly, you're elevating the learning experiences that you are providing to your students, uh, which is the entire reason that Sanford Inspire exists in the first place, is to enhance, improve, and inspire the youth and young adults that are in our education system today. Uh, so regardless of what module, regardless of how you want to use it, we recommend you go through the CARE process each and every time. This process could be applied in a variety of different settings. So the three main ways we see modules get applied are through individuals where it's more of a personalized learning approach or an individual growth plan that is specific to the to the unique person going through it and it's more of a one by one case by case basis uh, for users going through modules. Another scenario we see is small groups of teachers. So this might be a PLC, this might be a grade level team, this might be just a, a a group of friends who happen to all teach and they're going through modules together as a collective group. So they're each completing the module in, in their own account, but they're moving through the experience and serving as a so, sort of a support network as they implement the strategies into their setting. And the last strategy is an entire faculty. So this could be, this could be a cohort of pre-service teachers. This could be an entire school uh, school faculty or school campus. This could be uh, any sort of large scale group that is going to get a consistent learning experience around a particular topic that is important to that group. Um, again, each user is going through the module in their own account, but this allows for an entire collective group to get 
a consistent experience and have a uh, similar foundation across every individual by making sure they go through each of those experiences. To give some specific examples of what does this look like? So yeah, you could do it on your own. You could do it with a group. You could do it with a large group. But what does it actually look like for people to use modules in this domain across these different use case scenarios? So I wanted to give some examples to that. Two of the examples are going to be in higher education and one will be in PK through 12. So one of the things we've seen in higher education is we saw uh, the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College here at ASU took the culturally responsive pedagogy topic, the six modules in that topic, and integrated all six of those modules into existing coursework that was happening at the uh, at the bachelor degree level. So there were a series of different classes that needed, that needed to be completed for the bachelor's degree. And these six modules were integrated throughout the degree program to ensure that every student in that program was going to be experiencing every one of these culturally responsive pedagogy modules throughout their program experience. Um, and so this is more of a, more of a large scale um, comprehensive implementation where every user is going through every module in a particular topic. Another thing we've seen in higher ed, also at the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College here at ASU, was focusing in on the teacher inquiry module. And this module was implemented as a way to provide a consistent unifying experience for this topic that was really important to the college. So teacher inquiry was identified as a core focus area that the college wanted to emphasize. And this module was used to train uh, pre-service teachers across multiple programs uh, in how to understand that topic and implement it in their own, in their own uh, setting. So without, regardless of where they're at in their day-to-day uh, -day life, they could understand this concept consistently across all of the students and also be able to take it into the classrooms where they're working and use it. Um, so that's another higher ed example. And then on the PK through 12, PK through 12 side, Glendale Elementary School District is a partner of ours here in the Phoenix area, and they are using Sanford Inspire within their new teacher induction program. So like many, many districts, every new teacher to the district during their first few years has some additional professional development requirements that they need to complete. And during their first year of the program, they're doing other work with Sanford Inspire. But during the second year of the program, the district really wanted to focus in on culturally responsive pedagogy and have that topic of modules serve as the foundation for the second year teachers in their district. And so they already had a structure in place where teachers are coming together on a regular basis. Teachers are talking and debriefing what's happening in their classrooms on a regular basis. And there's a, there's a professional development system that was already in place. They took our culturally responsive pedagogy topic of modules and embedded that topic into the system they already had so that all new teachers during their second year induction program were required to complete the culturally responsive pedagogy modules one at a time throughout the year. And that served as the basis for what are they talking about? What are they debriefing about? What are they applying into their classrooms? It's centered around our culturally responsive pedagogy modules, um, which was a really exciting implementation for us. So these are just a few examples to show the range of the modules in this professional practices uh, topic, uh, domain, and also the range of the applications for those modules. So there's a lot of different modules and there's also a lot of different things you can do with each of those modules. So just wanted to um, give some information about how to do that. So as we uh, transition into the last phase of the webinar, I want to recap everything that you've learned today. Uh, so the three focus areas that we had for this webinar that we've accomplished are giving more information about the research and development behind this particular domain of professional practices. Also talk about what can you do with these modules. You now have a very thorough understanding of what's in this domain. How do you take this and put it into practice in your setting? Uh, and then also to understand at the higher education level, understanding how does this domain impact and support 
the work happening in our teacher preparation programs across the country. So we feel uh, we've accomplished those three things. Hopefully you agree. Uh, if you don't, now is the time to ask questions, uh, seek clarification, and allow us to uh, make sure you're leaving with everything you need to move forward successfully. Thank you, Brian. Um, thank you so much to our speakers. Just really quick shout out to Brian and Lasita for giving us a fantastic presentation and overview of some of the Inspire modules for this domain. So yes, now is the time to ask your questions. Go ahead and put them into the questions box and we will read them out loud to our speakers. I do have some questions that we can go ahead and get started with. So this one is asking, um, do all modules in the professional practices domain have strategies that can be used or implemented the very next day? Yes. Um, I would say that every single one of these modules, um, one, you will learn the theory um, and research behind whatever the topic area is, which was essential when we were designing modules. We didn't want to just blindly give strategies to people. We wanted people to understand why those strategies were going to work, like what we've learned about those, what research has to say behind them. So yes, they you will learn about the theory, but you will also talk about or see examples of those strategies within the module. You will always have a takeaway resource that whether Let's say the the like some of the topics in the culture response of pedagogy, some of that information is really to help you be more introspective into your own understanding about who you are and culture and race and your own identity. So then you can also be much more aware about how you communicate, what sort of things you're doing in your classroom that are either um, that can then be more uh, respectful or open to cultural and identity of other students, uh, students in your classroom. So whether it's a, a reflective, um, a, a reflective sort of guide for yourself or it's specific strategies of like, hey, think about this or what sort of actions you can take. Yes, every single module has a resource bundle that you can walk away with that you can start doing something in your classroom immediately. One thing I would add to that is more of the global level is the reason Sanford Inspire exists as an entire program is for that exact question, to make professional development more personalized, more applicable, and more useful in the immediate future. And so uh, our model under that global vision is to allow for teachers in one hour or less to understand research around a particular topic, get some strategies, get some tools, and be prepared uh, not to be a master or an expert the very next day, but to start refining their practice, to start tweaking things and doing things a little bit differently in the immediate future. Awesome. Very well stated. All right. Next question here. Is it possible to say a bit more about how the elevate portion of a module is implemented and evaluated? That's a really good question. Um, in terms of the Elevate being implemented, I would say the Elevate is more the results of the implementation than necessarily like an implementation step. Um, and so by going through modules, trying things out, and then iterating and refining those applications, you are becoming a better, more inspirational teacher. And that's going to impact you as a professional and also the students with whom you work. Um, so I would say as far as uh, as an action item, Elevate is more the result of the action than the action itself. In terms of how is it evaluated and researched, on the Sanford Inspire website, sanfordinspire.org, there's a tab at the top right called Research and News. And we have several different uh, research studies as well as uh, conference papers that are in that section of our website and and all of those research studies and conference papers focus around the implementation and the impact of Sanford Inspire modules so uh, there is lots of really good information there in the interest of time I won't divulge all of that now but to to answer the question, yes, there is information about the evaluation and it can be most easily accessed on our website 
in the research and news section. Awesome, thank you. Another question is, do, do uh, participants get a certificate for completing the modules? Yes, good question. Yes, every user gets a certificate for every module they go through. So I spoke a little, a little bit earlier about like the global view. Our vision is that you don't have to go through every module. You don't have to go through them in a certain order. You don't have to go through them at a certain time. So any individual who goes through any module is going to get a certificate that is specific to them and specific to that module. So at the end of each module, as long as you've completed the entire module, as long as you've passed the assessment with a 100%, you will automatically have a certificate generated to acknowledge and, and affirm the development that you've experienced in that module. So if, if a user goes through five modules, they'll get five certificates. Every single module has its own certificate and they're automatically populated as soon as the entire module is complete and the assessment is passed with 100%. And then Brian, that's produced as a PDF, correct? Yes. Um, and just to sort of speak to what Brian had spoken about with the care implementation is like in the districts or um, the higher mm -hmm. education setting where these modules were utilized. And like I said, like Brian was saying, I think a lot of these modules, the beauty of them is that they have been utilized, They they have the ability to be implemented within the structures that are already in place. So for example, like you were talking about the Glendale School District, um, that those, um, those certificates were part of them. That was one way of showing that they had completed the module then for them to be able to start having conversations or like the next steps, like the certificates were part of um, demonstrating that they had that teachers had completed the modules and that were mm -hmm. part of that whole overarching sort of structure. Awesome, thank you guys. All right, next question. Does Stanford Inspire have any of the frameworks mentioned as a guide for pre-K-12 and higher ed? Um, so in terms of like, do we have the Danielson or Marzano or Teaching as Leadership or the TAP framework, we do not distribute those frameworks. Um, we aren't like formally tied to those frameworks. We just use those as the foundation for our framework because they were prominent frameworks uh, accepted and recognized by the education community already. And so rather than reinvent the wheel, we wanted to lean on those existing uh, accepted prominent frameworks that are out there. One thing we do have uh, as far as how do you, so a lot of districts might might subscribe to one of those frameworks in their district and we want to allow for Sanford modules to be used within those frameworks as well. And so there's a couple different things we have to help you crosswalk or connect modules in the Sanford framework into the Danielson framework or into the Marzano framework or into the uh, in-task standards at the higher education level. So a couple different things I'll speak to there. For the in-task standards, which are most common in the higher ed education settings, at the end of every coaching guide, like Lacita was sharing, there is a standard section that shows which in-task standards that particular module most closely aligns to in the in-task framework. Additionally, for Danielson and Marzano as two very popular frameworks on the K-12 side, we have crosswalk documents that have been created that show how the Samford Inspire topics and domains best align to the Danielson or the Marzano topics and domains. It's not a perfect one-to-one -one correlation um, just because that's not the way this thing works, um, but there are crosswalks that say when Sanford talks about professional practices and culturally responsive pedagogy, here are some topics in Danielson and Marzano that are most closely related to that. Um, there are some instances with some of our more progressive and unique topics that there isn't uh, representation for those topics in the other frameworks, but in any instance that there is, we acknowledge those connections between our framework and theirs. So um, those documents are available too. Um, we can make sure those get shared out with the uh, with the 
follow up to this webinar. Thank you, Brian. So we actually have our uh, program manager, Veronica Calvo, here with us, and she has a couple things to say about that question. Good morning, everybody. Um, so excited to see all the participation and all the questions on this webinar. As for what Brian just stated, I, I have the Danielson uh, comparisons and the frameworks as well as um, well, the Danielson and Marzano, so both of them. So if you are interested in looking at the cross work of um, of what uh, we put together, please send me an email. There will be a slide at the very end of this presentation with my contact information, and I will be able to send these out to you. Thanks, Veronica. All right, next question is, is there a set of modules per domain? And this is a two-part question. And will new modules be created that continue the teaching in each, in each domain? I can answer the second one, but why don't you guys answer, is there a set number of modules per domain? No, there, um, there is not a set number of modules per domain. What we really wanted to do, and like as we had sort of talked through um, sort of the origin story of the framework is we really wanted um, the topics and the modules to really come up organically through what we were finding from the different frameworks that you were created were used um, in the creation of the Sanford Inspire framework, as well as what is organic and coming through in our research um, of the different sort of topic areas, like what's most salient, what sort of was the cream that was rising to the top, um, and then what were we hearing from the field? What were some of the needs? Um, we had the benefit of being very closely linked to a lot of districts and have a lot of partnerships. We also had wonderful partnerships with faculty members within Arizona State University. Um, and so those were the things that really led to the development of different modules within each one of the topics. So you will see a range of things, um, obviously like in professional practices, we have three topic areas and 16 modules that shuffle out between all of those different topic areas. But then you can go into a much larger domain like planning and delivery and there is probably 20 plus 30 plus modules in there. So really we allowed the research and the needs from the field to sort of dictate what topics, what modules were created or what were of the greatest need um, out there in education. Thank you. Veronica, do you want to mention something about the second part to that question? Sure, I'll address the second part. Um, yes, Sanford Inspire is ever evolving. We continue to um, you know, just work on the actual program and so we will be developing um, new modules in the future um, to make sure that we're up to date with what's currently going on in education. So that will be in the near future and we'll, of course we'll always give our users an updates on, on how we're moving forward with that plan. Thanks Veronica. All right, we have uh, just one last question I want to get, wanted to get in and we'll move on and close the end of the webinar. Uh, can, the cert sort of, can the certificates be used for recertification? So, can I answer this yeah, question? Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, so, y yes, yes, this question is, is a very interesting one. So, um, the certificates can be used for recertification, but it has to be approved by uh, your state. So, you, if you're working with a university um, that uh, currently has Sanford Inspire and they are able to uh, apply the recertification, uh, you know, hours towards your license, then yes, for sure. Um, but um, it is the user's responsibility to make sure that their state and that the university is um, able to provide that to them. One thing I'll add to that, in our experience in Arizona, every, uh, in Arizona they give the choice to the district and the K-12 side anyways to decide what counts and does not count toward recertification hours. So the State Department of Education does not hold that authority, they defer it out into the individual districts. Not just as context, we never experienced a district denying Sanford Inspire certificates to count towards those recertification hours. So every time we spoke with a district, there was unanimous agreement that these modules are high quality and research-based and absolutely count towards recertification hours. That doesn't mean every district in the country is gonna feel that way. 
and every state might do recertification a little bit differently, but that's just in context about what we experienced in Arizona. Awesome, Brian, thank you for sharing. Okay, we are uh, down to the end of our webinar. This, uh, the information you see on the screen is our contact information. If you need to get a hold of us, we have our number, our email, our website. And lastly, I'm just going to share Veronica's information. If you need to contact Veronica directly, there is her email. Um, and of course, just wanna say thank you to our presenters, Brian and Lasita, for doing an, a fantastic job on presenting this domain to us. There are more to come. We have a whole, this whole fall, we will be doing a series on the Sanford Inspire domains. And this is just the first one. Our next webinar is on the 26th. You can go ahead and register for that on the Sanford Inspire website. Lisita and Brian will be back with us again to present on uh, motivation. So please register, stay tuned for that. Uh, if you can't attend, still register because you'll get the recording. Uh, following this webinar, you will get the access to the handouts, the recording, uh, in probably about 24 to 48 hours. Lastly, just a quick reminder, uh, if you can please take our survey that's going to launch uh, right as this webinar closes. It's very short, shouldn't take more than a minute, but we really do appreciate your feedback and we really do put um, your feedback into, into play. Uh, so again, thank you to our audience for taking the time to spend uh, with us today. And um, with that, I'm gonna let you all go. And thank you again, Brian and Lasita.